Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for Friday, September 28th, 2018. I am once again joined by my lovely co-hosts, Steph Hodge, Chaz Marler, and Lincoln Demers. How's everybody doing? Good. Hello. Good to see you all. It's good to be back. I have returned from the cloud, and we found <laughs> we found rainbows. Yay! Not, not and storms. unicorns. <laughs> yes, rainbows and unicorns all in the cloud. Yeah, so Board Game Geek has moved its uh, servers to the cloud. We've been on our own hardware since 2000, starting with a small computer that I kept under my desk and occasionally would accidentally get turned off by my uh, cleaning lady. She would vacuum and like hit the button for some reason i don't know oh, so no. back in the day if you remember bgg being down that's why it was the uh, cleaning cleaning team that was cleaning the house anyway so we're now in the cloud environment and we used google so uh for those people that were betting which one we would use google so if you had the the pool for that you win um <laughs> it was really easy to get everything set up this is not an advertisement for google but um i really liked the way it all went and i hope the site feels faster to me uh, I hope it feels faster for you. I noticed it immediately. It was fantastic. Yeah, we. Uh, it's definitely a lot of, you know, some of the hardware we've had has been aging. We hadn't bought a new uh, server in quite a few years. So we were just maintaining the servers we had by, you know, putting in new hard drives and new installing new software and upgrading all that. But definitely this is a boost. And so we're really happy about that. Um, hopefully we can continue to improve with... Uh, not being limited by uh, space or RAM or disks or any of that stuff anymore. So, And I don't have to drive down to the data center to change a, a hard drive in the middle of the night. Lincoln was with me on April, what was it, April 1st? Around April 1st. Back, and we, yeah. uh, we had all those things we were doing and driving to the middle of the night to go fix stuff. That was fun. Oh, wow. It went the whole weekend and you, I was visiting and you ended up staying up the whole time working on, the, uh, on right. getting that going. I don't recommend staying up more than two days in a row. <laughs> oh, I remember wow. on the third day. I don't day, think I could. <laughs> it's, it, I mean, I, I wanted to sleep, but I couldn't. Like my, like my stress level was so high, I could not sleep. So I was wow. like f- trying to force myself to like, wow. and I would wake up like every hour kind of thinking like in a panic. It's weird. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to not be in that situation anymore. So anyway, moving Definitely. on. Uh, I, I was, I was just going to say that I'm really glad that I picked Google uh, in the pool. For what we moved to so that turned out really well you had inside knowledge jazz <laughs> <clears throat> you just lost your cut <laughs> so this week we opened up registration for bgg spring 2019 which will be at the hyatt regency inside the dfw airport that convention is not moving so i want to be clear spring convention is still at the dfw hyatt regency that's all i'm going to say to avoid any more confusion <laughs> uh the convention is over Memorial Day weekend in 2019, and it's the 24th to the 27th of May, if you don't know what Memorial Day weekend is. You guys, uh, Steph and Chaz, that was your first time at BGG Spring. What did you think this year? Oh, I had so much fun. There's table dexterity games in the hallways. You could just play at any time. Just go up to it and learn a new dexterity game. Oh, I love that. And then there's a huge library, all the games you get to play. Oh, it was so much fun, and I can't wait. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, BGG Con in November is always one of the most laid back cons that just feels like a giant game day. Somehow spring managed to be even more laid back and feel even more like just a nice relaxed game day. Uh, I I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to the next one. Cool. Well, it was great having you guys there. That's for sure. I think Scott uh, Scott got a game of Ginkgo... uh... Ginkopolis in, right? Uh, yes. Steph, Steph and I. And, uh, <laughs> and Rodney, right? <laughs> and Rodney. Yes. Played yes. I think I've already right scheduled for BGG November to play like three games of Ginkopolis because everybody wants to learn it. <laughs> Has there any been any news of the reprint? I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard anything since the last time, so I should follow up with that because it should happen. <laughs> Another event that was announced recently is the BGG at Sea Cruise, and that's going to yes. be in 2019. I'm not going to go over all the details here, but if you go to the front page of BGG, look for the cruise. It's like a little post in the upper like corner. You should be able to read all about it. It's going out of Miami in 2019. I don't know the dates off the top of my head. but End of August. It's the 24th. It's in the end of August. Yes. It's after Either Gen Con. It starts or ends on the 24th of August, I think. Yes. Something like that. 
that will be so uh, amazing. And that'll it's the fun. the thing I do know is it's the largest ship in the world, uh, the Royal Caribbean. That's larger by like a meter than the previous largest ship in the world, which I was on as well last year. And that the was Symphony, an right? Trip. This year it's the, the Harmony. Symphony. Next year's the Harmony. the Harmony. Correct. Yeah. That's why I'm so excited. Those, I want to go on that gigantic ship. Yeah, those ships are a technological marvel. Like we just got back from the Alaskan one, which was just a couple months ago. Uh, and that's like a tiny ship compared to the, I mean, it's like, it really feels like you think, oh wow, this thing's huge. And there's so many people, these giant ones are just another, it's just unbelievable. Wow. Like, wait, I, I can't, can't wait for imagine. you guys to see it. <laughs> yeah. It, it was hard to imagine, but once you're there and then you're like, oh wow, it's like a floating city. I mean, it really is. It's, <laughs> it's like it a really quarter is. mile to walk across, I think, or something like that. It's really, really wow. massive. It's not that big. Well, we had a really good time and you kept telling us how the, uh, main, uh, I guess it's kind of the mall of the thing was a fraction of the size of the of the Symphony of the Seas. So I'm sure next the promenade. Uh, yeah, yeah. The har- the harmony right. will be more amazing. You know. Right. So on the harmony, as I understand it, they're re implementing the Central Park, which is actually kind of like a uh, three or four story tall open air atrium with a bunch of trees and grass, and that's wow. where all the specialty restaurants were on the previous ship. So you could go and and, and eat at those restaurants, and it was just really cool to just hang out. Felt like there was more oxygen for some reason. I don't know. It was just like the the breeze would come in. It was really nice. That's cool. So that's, that's another really feature. Cool. They they also have this huge water slide that goes from the, I think from like the you know fourteenth deck down to the fifth deck. It's just giant. You go down to the pool. Wow. Level. So, it's yeah. The did you ride it? Check Scott? it out. No, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think I would do it either. <laughs> it's really scary, actually, because it, it goes. I mean, it's a it's a fully enclosed thing. It's a tunnel. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm kind of like beyond those years, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe next time. Maybe this time we'll do it. I don't know. Okay. I won't. <laughs> and after watching, and after watching a 70 year old man on the wave rider like literally go head feet up, I saw his feet poking out of the water. I'm like, I'm not. Oh doing no. That there's just this crazy stunt stuff. And the rock, rock wall, I'm not sure I can do. But if you are able and willing and you sign the waivers, they'll let you do whatever you want on those ships. <laughs> you guys sign those uh, waivers. Power you do. They're, I'm not kidding about the waivers. I bet. So let's on, move on to everybody's favorite segment. What have you been playing? Let's start with Steph. I know you've been playing a ton. Oh, I've been Over playing Over Labor Day so weekend, much. you just played a monster number of games. <laughs> Every weekend. You know, it's, what's crazy is I think I'm on schedule to learn like 500 new games this year. <laughs> Just, That's like half the games. It's like half the games. <laughs> so it's like I play literally every, you name it, I've probably played it at this point. I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but some of my favorites recently in the past couple weekends um, have been Ariel and Realm of Sand. And both of these have polyominoes that you're placing on, on your mats. And there are different there are different mechanics, of course, but you're trying to best fit these shapes on your map to create different patterns. So for Ariel, you're trying to get big groupings of like green, and then you can get green meeples. And then if you have the most green out of anybody, you can get the double meeple. But you're all all the while trying to create lines kind of like Tetris so the the bar is moving down each each round so if it ever hits you you lose the bar so you don't want to lose the bar because you get more points if you don't and so you're trying to move the bar up much like Tetris and it's coming down at you but you're trying to push it up um so that's a lot of fun and that was uh, Ariel? the rel sorry that was Ariel that's Ariel yeah um Mebo games um that's a the Portugal company and um, Realm of Sand, the new Emperor's uh, S4 is one that I got to play at Gamma, which I was so excited about then. I really thought it was going to be my game of the year, but there's been so many amazing games this year. So it's going to be at the top somewhere, but it's, it's like a mixture of patchwork and splendor. If you can imagine that. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, so that's a lot of fun. You're, you're creating uh, these patterns, trying to build the buildings and, and score the points in the middle. And yeah, it's a it's a race game to get like so many sand points first. Yeah, I think I saw you playing that at the Gamma trade show. Near yeah, the I end played of it a couple show. times. I, it's really it's really right it up my alley. It's very super interesting cool. for sure. Yeah. And it plays in like 40 minutes. So it's like 
it's perfect. It's it's like it's one of the perfect games, <laughs> I think. Um, finally, I've been playing a couple games of History of the World this coming at that 2018 this year. So there was the first one, which was seven epochs, and then there was the brief History of the World game, which was six epochs, and then there's this one, which is five epochs. <laughs> so if you're familiar with the game at all, um, it's it works. Kind of like I, I've been comparing it to Small World because every time I go back to compare it to Small World, I find more comparisons that just works for Small World. <laughs> huh. um, so if you like Small World, this is like the next step up. Like, what what kind of things do you find that are comparable? So um, at the end of your turn, you score everything on the map that you've already completed. But each each epic, you're drafting a, a power for the round, and you're drafting a nation for the round. So it's kind of like Small World. You get the power for the guy. Um, and so then you expand as best you can. And then everybody goes basically into decline at the end of the turn. So you don't actually get to reinvest in what you've already claimed, but if it's still on the map come your next turn, you do get to score for them. So there's a bit of area control there. So it works the same way where you're trying to take over other people's regions, but... Um, Is it set up where that you're not necessarily playing one faction or one race civilization throughout the whole game? It changes right. each round? Yeah, so each epic you're getting a new nation. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm not playing the Sumerians through. I, I'm going to use the Sumerians to my advantage when I can. Correct. And huh. so if, if that's the the, ra- the the race that you draft or um, the region that you draft, then you, you'll get that. And then there's a turn order for the order which you draft. It's all on the back of all the cards. And depending on the regions that you're controlling, you get more or less points depending on the epic. And so... If you're familiar with the history of the world games, it it didn't really change a whole lot, but it took out um, a few like goals, uh, majority scorings. Uh, it made it a lot more streamlined, in my opinion. So I works. played the original Avalon. I don't know if that was the original, but I played the Avalon Hill version back probably 20 years ago. <laughs> and it was yeah, the, I haven't played the big was... long three hour endeavor of the uh, history so of the I world. I think it took us like half a day to play it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like six <laughs> to seven hours. Yeah. So now it's only like two hours. Yeah. This one's probably about two hours. Okay. Plays up to six players, probably best four to six players. I do remember really liking it, but I felt like the time commitment was a big one. Well, yeah, when you're playing a seven-hour game, I mean, th- I think you'll probably like this one more just because it's it, you can complete it and you feel like you've done something. <laughs> um, and I was losing l- l- this past game that I played. I was losing the whole time, but I managed to have like a major comeback and I came in second place and I was just short of first place. So it was so close. I had a major comeback at the end. It was awesome. <laughs> now, there's a good factor of war game in there, right? Like you are attacking... Um, yeah, you there is attacking, but it's not like you're building up defenses for your already existing nations. Does that make sense? Like, you can just move in on somebody and expect... You, you're basically expecting to lose what you have. And if you keep it, that's awesome. <laughs> okay. So it's not like you're building up huge defenses and that you've spent so much time putting in... And then they came and just destroyed you, and you feel like, oh my gosh. So you don't have that feeling of, like, depletion. And... Despair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's always the hard part of war games, is, like, the feeling of despair right. after you get wiped off the So board. that's why it works. I mean, you have the same feeling as Small World, right? So you're, you're just, you don't get attached to these nations that you've taken claim to. Cool. Yeah, and then so you can pair the, so you pair the power with the sieve, right? So you make a combination. Yeah. So it's infinite, re- well, infinite in quotes, replayability when you can try different combinations. And you yeah, so each epic play. there's like eight different nations and, and power cards and stuff. So, and, you, and you're only ever playing at most six players. So there's there's lots of room for combinations and, you know, hopeful strategies. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Chaz, what have you been playing? Well, I have been taking the approach of actually sitting down for a six, seven, eight hour game. Uh, Cause I have been, oh my goodness. I have been playing uh, this bad boy right here. <laughs> Actually, no, it's just, just oh my gosh, uh, it's so I, big. <laughs> I, uh, I got in uh, two games, well, two game sessions of uh, TI4, Twilight Imperium 4th edition. Um, about a month ago, uh, about four of us got together and uh, to play it. And um, 
it had either been so long or we had some new players where we had to start over from learning the rules from scratch uh, a month ago. So we got together at noon and then started uh, reading rule books and watching videos. By 3.30, we were ready to play. <laughs> and we played until 9 p.m. and got halfway through the game. So we, we considered that just a learning game. And we decided to get together again for our next monthly get together and, and play it again. So just weekend before last, uh, that happened. So we got our second game session in of it. And we played, I think, about s between six to seven hours. There were four of us. And we, we had a hard stop um, at 8 p.m. And uh, we got all the way to the very last round. We got like one half of the way through the last round. And who was going to win kind of became obvious. So we just called it when we hit our hard stop at the time limit. But it was the first time I have been able to sit down with other people and actually play, you know, uh, an actual full complete game of Twilight Imperium. And it was it was fantastic. That's and cool. <laughs> that sounded so enthusiastic. No, I, I mean, it's awesome. We don't, you know, to, to play long games is really tough. Scott has been playing a long game, which he'll tell us about in a few minutes, but we just don't, we don't get to do it. It's once in a blue moon for us. But Oh, 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 I know. I mean, 99% of what I play are, you know, 45 minute to hour and a half games with, you know, with my family right. and, um, or at a game group, if I'm like, you know, co-hosting or doing something else, you know, you're, you're distracted. So it is so rare, um, to be able to sit down and really sink your teeth into a longer game. It just seems to be harder and harder as time goes by. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's one that just never really, it's not one that I just want to play. It's not, <laughs> it's just too much time. This is way too much time. How many players did you have, Chess? We had four each time. Oh, and the best part of it, though, is that the second game that we played, uh, two people from the original one couldn't make it. So we subbed in two new people who hadn't played. So we had to do the whole rules rigmarole all over again oh, no. with the two new players. <laughs> but by then, we had stream streamlined it down to a science, and it only took about an hour, hour and a half to go from you know zero to 60 um, and have them up and, up and ready to play. <laughs> well, that's fortunate, because boy, oh boy, I, I can imagine. I mean, obviously, the more you teach the, those types of games, the the shortcuts you can figure out that you don't need to sp to speak to uh, at the very beginning of the game, but uh, it's still best to try to get as much of that in so people know what they're dealing with from the get go. Oh yeah, yeah. It was one of the games where you know we we planned several weeks ahead, so the people that were coming, we gave everyone homework. You know, here's a trilogy of of videos. Go watch these videos before you come over and you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, it paid off though. It, it paid off. Uh, would have paid off a little bit better if I had. I had one, but but that that's a story for another episode. <laughs> Give it a shot. You could do it. No, that the, the game did kind of come down to the wire. Uh, between I think three of the four of us were like uh, three of the four of us were at the eight point because we were playing the ten points. So three to three out of four of us were at the eight point, and one player was at nine points. Um, and it came down to that very last round um, when you have the status phase. Uh, where you go and actually can cash in the missions to earn victory points. You do it in in the player order for uh, for that turn. And so it came down to the order that people were going to cash in their status um, missions to get their victory points for those. And uh, so whoever was first in turn order was the one that was managed to get like the two extra points they needed to to win. So it was uh, it really was a close game. Um, uh, you know, through all, which was nice. When you have a six-hour game like that, to have it come down to the wire, that's, that's really, really, uh, really a good feeling. Right. It's always frustrating to play a long game like that and know that you have no chance of winning. Like from a, you know, maybe like halfway through, you're like, oh, there's no way I could come back. You know, it's, it, it speaks to the design that it's very, I guess, balanced in that way. Um, I remember playing TI3, Twilight Imperium 3, back in the day, and we played the basic game and we always felt like someone just ran away with it but we switched mm. to the variant age of empire which i don't know is that in the new version do you, did you go through any of the variants or anything uh we didn't go through any of the variants so it, i'm not sure if it's in there or not which so the age of empire variant was i felt a superior way to play ti3 so i'm tr a little how, foggy how on the details so i think as I recall, with Age of Empire, you would flip up all of the mission, all of the victory points face up, and you could claim okay. them at any time. Versus 
and this is this is like a long time ago, so bear with me if I'm wrong. I as I recall, you flip up each victory point mission each round. You flip up a yes, a, right? Uh, yeah, you start with a few, and then every round you flip. You up flip one up. You well, in Age of Empire, yeah. you play with them all face up, oh. which I felt was a very nice way to play because if I know I can't make win that points, I know what I can build towards for a future points making. I don't know. Yeah, that goal. could really allow everybody to kind of go in a different direction if they need to. Yeah, so I wonder if they've kept that variant. Um, huh. I really remember liking the game. The politics part of it was my favorite, where you have the the voting on the laws that change the rules of the game. It's, and we and the rule, I, as I remember, the deck of different laws was like you know three or four inches thick, and you yeah, just so many different ways to modify that game. Um, of course, it's a war game, and you can wipe somebody out pretty badly if you focus on them. But, uh, you know, that's that goes part of the wargaming. If you're living the wargaming way, you got to expect that. You might, you might get knocked out. I assume you guys kind of just kept everybody in check and nobody got, like, ganged up on or bullied. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. We, everybody kind of got their own parcel of the universe, and we butted up against each other, so we had a lot of, like, border conflicts, but everyone's home world uh, kind of stayed safe, so no one got, like, knocked out or whittled down so far that they were basically doing nothing each turn, right. so it, it was nice. Well, that's good. That makes for a more fun game, too. Yeah. So speaking of long games, I have been playing The Rise of Queensdale, which I'm in my, if I add it all up, 30, 30th hour of playing that is wow. three yeah so i play every well if i can i play every saturday i didn't obviously last weekend when we had the cloud installation uh or two weeks ago i should say um but it's we go like a 10 hour day we go from like noon to midnight minus a couple hours for eating <laughs> stuff like that so it's 10 hours of game so i have we finished 30 hours this past weekend we are not complete yet that's oh that my should God. be shocking stuff Steph's <laughs> eyes just went. <laughs> Here's the What's thing. What's the premise? I really love the game a lot. So I am looking forward to the next 10 hours, which I think it's probably going to be maybe like six to eight hours probably to finish it. It's the premise of the game, it's a legacy game. So oh. you play, you probably play one hour games, right? So we probably played, I guess if you do the math, what is that? 30 games, maybe? That is no, a sorry. lot of games. Sorry. A little less than that. Not 30. It's more like t- 10. 10 to, tw- 10 to 12 games, I guess. If you want to... If cut, They're big, it's basically like an hour to an hour and a half of time. So... Am I doing the math right on that? No. Nope. Cool. It seems right. So basically... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm on the spot. I'm doing the math in my head. It's more, It's it's like 15 games, I guess. Yeah, something like that. So, probably yeah, 15. if it was an hour and yeah. a half, it'd probably be about... Yeah, they're about hours. an hour and a half, you know, and there's a little bit of time to... There's a little bit of wrap-up time. There's a little bit of setup time. And you're basically in charge of a burrow in the queen's land. Uh, the, the queen is ill. She's dying. So you have to collect herbs to make medicine for her. And you're also building up the castle or the cathedral in the, in the middle of this town. Um, so you build buildings. And the board is, like, mostly empty at the beginning, right? It has a very cool uh, plunger, like a little tiny mini plunger that you use to extract pieces and tiles out of the board to replace with buildings. That's why I want the game much. is just the plunger. The plunger is amazing, <laughs> plunger? and it works. It works perfectly at the beginning, and then once you start like filling everything up, it like it works less well. But it's it's needed to pull the pieces out without disturbing your entire board, right? Because they're they're pre-cut uh, hexagons, and they are um, embedded in the board, and they have like you know they all keep each other in because they're tight, tightly packed. Uh, But you pull them out, and you excavate, and then you build buildings, and you build buildings for production, and you build buildings for storage, and you build buildings for all kinds of things. Now, the cool thing is, legacy, every turn, something weird happens and changes the rules of the game, or adds rules, or makes things harder, or makes things easier. There's There's a lot of variation in the game. We probably missed maybe, like, 15 special rules that, like, that we'll never see probably so there is definitely a variation of that yeah they're kind of like they would change the rules in a way like they'll add like one rule or add one thing to the board there's a ton of stickers there's like seven or eight pages of stickers all of rules and then there's another five or six pages of stickers that you put on the board and there's five punch boards of tiles that you add to the board and 
it's just, I think if you learn the game all at the beginning, it'd be like overwhelming, right? Like all the things you can do. We're at that point. We're actually in the last, you know, final third of the game. So maybe quarter, last final quarter of the game. And the rules are just, there's, a, you know, a lot. Um, and it slowly builds up. So your early games are quick. And the turns are very quick. It's a dice worker placement game. You have, um, you have you roll your dice, and you place them as workers to do things. Um, another cool thing is you get to put stickers on your dice, and you get to modify them. So oh. all your dice can be customized. I have I've taken a lot of special rolling dice. Like they give you, they're just like one sticker in total. So only ever one person will um, will have that die. And it creates like a cool rules thing, and they interact with each other. So it's it's very good. I mean, I really like it. Um, wow. It's a little big time commitment, though, right? And I would suggest if you're going to play it, play it with three players, four players. There's a, there's a bit of a mechanic in the game where you kind of have a catch up thing. So you have a lot of games that are just kind of like they don't really advance the storyline, but they do have special things happen. So every game always has something special. But we want to get through the storyline because the storyline is very intriguing. You know, there's this weird thing with the queen dying, and we want to see what happens to her. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna ask if it has an overall story arc where it does, it's going yeah. to have. Okay, so it's going to have a definitive ending. Yeah, it also has a very cool. I don't know. All right, spoiler. I'm not, I'm not giving exactly the spoiler, but I'm, I'm hinting at what happens in the game that I think is fantastic. So, fast forward maybe 30, 60 seconds right here. There is a point in the game where it could fork. That's all I'll say. Between okay. light and dark. Between light and dark, Ooh. which I think is awesome. And we have gone the light path. So oh, and that's there's not, this whole path of darkness that we don't That is not know correct. You would choose the dark path. I don't But I, I thought about it, actually. <laughs> I, I was like, I was kind of confused as how it was um, resolved. Like, they don't tell you how it happens, right? Like, some people might embrace, it says, it has a hint where it says, some people might embrace the light and some people might embrace the dark. But I didn't understand how it all worked so i kind of went for the light scott is a very benevolent guy but when it comes down to this stuff he will choose the dark path do not trust him ever <laughs> i like to see the dark side of games sometimes <laughs> because most people are you know like i'm a good person right we all are good people we always play the good side in real life so what's it like to play the dark side the well, way you get to do that in games right so that's what i like to do however this time because the dark path was so devastating to the game, there's some things that happen if you go down the dark path. We, I avoided it. I was like, oh, that was terrible. Let's, I'm just going to try to make the light, do the light path happen, right? You learned your Not lesson? Knowing, I learned my lesson. So basically, <laughs> I, I veered us towards the light. Um, I made a lot of progress on the light side in the, in the, the game prior to it resolving with it, which fork to take. Um and so we, there's a whole set of stuff that we didn't see. Now I see it in the when I'm looking at the cards, so I know what it is. I'm not going to say anything, but it's very cool. I'll, I'll just point that out. So I hope there's a rainbow at the end of the light path. I hope there's a rainbow at the end of the game. I'm playing for the light. Are you going to buy another copy of the game and go the dark path? I don't think I'm going to play it again. Uh, That's a lot of game. That, Thirty plus hours. Now you know it's probably going to be like thirty six. These are real hours, right? Like. I wonder if you could set it up to be right at that point again, the same exact way. You cannot. And here's the downside of the game. You have to play with all the players, always, every time. Ah. Like, you can't have one person drop out and come back. It doesn't work. Because their burrow will become not... Yet there's too many things that happen to your burrow. Even in a game where you don't win it, your burrow uh, advances. Huh. Right? You're building buildings, you're doing things, you're basically... You're building up for the next game, and if you have one person just not show up and they don't play, their burrow is behind, and that can't, it can't. That it, it will just break the game. That's why I say three players. Do you think it would work two player? It will work with two player too. Yeah, I, I for sure. Here's the cool thing: the turns are lightning fast, which is why I love it. Right? You have your five dice, and you roll the faces, and you can only put those dice on the face of what they're due. Right? You can re-roll, and you can basically pay resources to change those faces to use them in other places. But ninety percent of the time, you're like, "Oh, I got a coin. I put it on a coin. Oh, I, I got a, I got an action. I'll do this action. And I, oh, I got wood. I'll take wood. You know, it's the, it's that kind of quick 20, 10, 20 second turns at most." slows down a little bit when you build buildings or do other things like move your you have a little uh I forget what he's called scout 
who goes to collect the herbs and you're like, you know, trying to figure out the best path to collect the herbs. Mm. That takes a little bit of time. And then you reveal the herbs, what you found on them, which could be like, you have to get all that stuff. Those are the slow turns. Plus then there's turns where you'll have like a courier. They have these, they have a, uh, a bag draw mechanism where you're drawing special craftsmen out of the bag. And some of them can be couriers, which bring new rules into the game for just that game only. So that's kind of cool. It's got a lot of cool stuff. I think it's going to be for, I hope not, but I think this game is going to be passed over because of legacy fatigue, right? Once you start playing a lot of legacy games, like you're just playing that and you're like, well, do we want to play that or do we want to play a lot of other games? This one has the distinction that uh, it's not co-op, right? So that is a, that is a difference. It's not a, right. It is competitive. It sounds fantastic. I worry a little bit about it getting overlooked. That's my, it's a, it's a pretty high price tag. It's like, I think 60 or 70 MSRP. It's a big box. You get a lot in there. You get a ton of game. Like I said, I've been playing for three days straight. Not straight in a row, but, you know, three full 10-hour yeah, right. days. Um, so it's it's got a lot of games. Now, a lot of the games, there's this is my criticism. When you make it to a goal, like let's say I reach my goal and I win. Like let's say I'm shooting for 20 points and I, and I get to 20 points and you don't. I advance on my, my goal marker, right? Like I advance to the next goal, which let's say it's... 27 points you are still shooting for the 20 right and when you can win quicker than me right because you only have to get to 20 and i have to get to 27 so you might have a game where not a lot happens and you just catch up right you'll get to 20 and i'll get to like let's say i get to 23 and almost nothing will happen that's very rare but it will happen um and sometimes i'll be let's say i'm two goals ahead of you there's almost no chance you won't get to your goal first before I get to my goal, right? So it kind of it's kind of a catch up mechanism to kind of keep everybody sort at the same same pace. Anyway, it's a great game, giving it big props. It's got a I you know I thought mm, it's another legacy game. Maybe it's like Charterstone ish, but it's not like Charterstone at all. It's very interesting. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, what else can I say about Queensdale? I hope I hope the ending is as awesome as the whole rest of the game has been. <laughs> yeah. Do you there know you when it's supposed to come back into stock at retail? Oh, is it not in all? stock right now? So it's sold out. No, I've been checking while you've been talking, oh. and I can't add it to my cart because <laughs> oh, it's out of stock. No. <laughs> well, that's a good sign. That means people bought it. I don't know anything about its kind of fulfillment or whatever. Um, I've been waiting for it for a long time, so I. I think I pre-ordered it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, hmm. I would get it then if I if you see it, like sign up for those. You know, remind me when it comes back in the stock. Mm. If you're if you're interested. Yeah, nice. And it's an Alea game. It's an interesting giant box. And it has a number one on the box side. So does that mean there's going to be a number two? That giant. It's a giant, huge box. It's like half of a Gloomhaven box. It's really big. It's big. So big kudos to Robinsberger and Inca and Marcus Brand, the designers, who normally, I mean, they're, they're all over the place with their designs, right? They make party games. They make strategy games. This is a very cool legacy. I guess their first try at legacy. So it's very, I feel very successful what it does. Well, they've been doing all those exit games. So they've got, you all know, the exit games, storytelling yeah. thing that they're doing too. So it yeah, sounds, kind of makes sense. Yeah, their team. If it's just them, it's amazing. But I assume maybe there's a team involved. I don't know. We, we should interview them and see how, how they come up with so much great stuff every year well they've got the whole family the kids design games too so it's a. Uh, I i don't know how many games games their kids have done but they have all designed games so that's pretty pretty cool got their <laughs> own little team going hey lincoln what have you been playing well you, you guys have been talking about these 30 hours we played two 30 minute games this week um <laughs> man they were deep a lot of playing uh we played uh sword crafters and um I played another game of Cahoots from Mayday Games, and uh, so let's start with Swordcrafters. Swordcrafters is this tile game that you split the array. I believe it's 16 tiles maybe per round with four players, and you start splitting them in the grid to break up it break it up into five uh, groups for uh, people to choose from. And the first player is gonna get a bunch of tiles almost every time. It seems like it's like six or four or six tiles minimum, and then, uh, or four minimum. And uh, 
what you're doing is you're selecting tiles to construct a sword. You actually, they're interlocking tiles, thick cardboard, and you're trying to go for sets and length. Um, there's like a having the same color down the side counts for something, you know, points, two points per tile, I believe. Consecutive, right? As long as you can keep them together. The problem is, is you must place them on four different faces. So you get three tiles. You may not even get to put the tile that you want to put in a specific position because you don't have the foundation built to put that tile in place. Um, it's really, and you can't rejigger anything you've done. Uh, it's really, really quite clever. Um, and of course we played and one of the guys just ran away with, he kept choosing first, first or second, which is huge. And so he just had a really long sword and got really fortunate in the right mix of, you know, people are looking for what's good for them, not what they can. It's really hard to choose to take something bad. And, you know, it's weird. I think the biggest thing that makes it, um, the biggest power in the game is going first. Uh, the problem is, right. is often the large pool gets that, that tile because going first is one of the tiles that's always in the same position. So that ends up being a large group of tiles often. Um, and so the guy will that start will take that again and make do with the five other tiles that he happened to have that round or whatever. Um, but really, really cool. And then Cahoots, I played at BGD Con Spring. And um, Ryan Burns was telling me how, how much he loved it and he really wanted me to play. And it's really, really great. I know I, t I probably talked about it before. This time wasn't, I wasn't playing with seasoned vets on that game. So it was a little bit different nature for the game. But I really, I like it because the way it works is when there's four players, there are six suits in the game, and you will have three different suits of the six, and everybody else will have a different set of three where you're pairing up, you're in cahoots with other players in the game, and you're trying to win those rounds and split the points. And it's always, I believe, four points that you're splitting up. And you could get them all if you if one player is let's say multiple suits win and one player has the most suits that of those t that win, then they get all the points, which never happened for us. But um, it's really, really clever and really neat. It's kind of challenging because it's contrary to what you're used to. You have to you have to look at what other people are doing and like, do I want that person to win? At the beginning of the game, Nikki was really doing well, and then all of a sudden, Dave um, really kept winning the suits. So, like he probably figured out what you need to do. You have to. The, the way it works on the round, you'll play eight cards if there's four players. You'll choose one card to keep and you'll choose one card to burn. So there's four going out every round. You're adding one back to your hand. And I think it's 11 rounds. And so you're trying to figure out what you should be shooting for at the end of the game when the card values drop. I mean, obviously there's some, you're, you have suits that you aren't involved in. You have those cards in your hand and you're like trying to get rid of them and somebody might take them back into their hand. And we had one person had three eights. Uh, that they oh, did wow. not have the suits for. So um, it was an interesting dynamic to see how that works. I'm very eager to play it again uh, with... Uh, we have, one of the people has moved out of town. Another One of the game nighters has moved out of town. And um, so I want to play it with uh, uh, Dave, Nikki, and myself at least, and one other to try it. Because it's such a great game. It really is neat. And it, des it deserves some attention because it's really a, a clever design. Yeah, it really makes you think. You're playing the whole game, you're like, okay, well, this seems easy. And then towards the end, you're like, what am I doing? How do I have yeah. these cards in my hand? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's really, really neat. And you need to see, there's there's actually communication that goes on with your partners because you have multiple partners. And you've like, if you're not drawing a card, D Dave came to that realization. He's like, Lincoln's not taking that card. I should have taken one of those cards because that means he has probably has a card. You know, there is no, you have partners, but it's not a traditional partnership game. It's really, exactly. really cool. Exactly. Because you're like, right. you have to like, you know, you have to trust the other guy has the heart because you want to play your diamond now and win the diamonds with this guy over here. <laughs> yeah, it's really neat. I like, I like the changing loyalty thing. Like you see, you see what's happening after the first four cards. You're like, okay, well, what can I do here? And then sometimes you're like, oh, it's time to slough off this card, right? Get rid of this thing now because it's not going to win. And then of course there's three other people after you often, right? If you're the first player to, that can foul up your, uh, let me get rid of this eight now, which is is risky for sure. So is it like yeah. four games of war, like where each suit is at war and the highest suit wins? Basically, yeah. So you just you're playing into this pile of cards. It's not like tricks where you have to follow lead or anything like. You're just playing. No, for, you just play what yeah. you want. And then the highest total wins. Total, the yes. Suit. Yeah. Of uh, a specific of the, suit. So, like, I might right. play a five diamond and he might play a, a three diamond. That will still beat the seven heart or whatever. Right. 
Right. Yeah. And then you split the points based on how many yeah. suits you, you match. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Your best bet to get rid of those cards that you don't want to use is to throw them on a pile. You're like, forget it. I'm not winning this round. And you you let them win and get that get that out of your hand at least, and hopefully you can draw a better card. And you hope to be able to draw the good cards that others are trying to get rid of. It's really really neat, because yeah. you know the average yeah. of the cards being played, the the total winning average usually drops by the end of the game. I mean, with some seasoned players, maybe that doesn't quite work out. You're able to hold right, on because you're those. burning you're burning cards out of the game, right? Like yes, so you're, you're burning cards out cards. of the game. Other people's high cards you burn. It's actually and you keep from four your to good eight high cards. I think it's a one oh. four and one eight and two two uh, fives, two sixes and two sevens, yeah. for each suit. Uh, each suit. So right. it's that's with four uh, that you play yeah. all those cards. Because if it you know you don't change. want the clubs, you definitely want to kill that eight clubs as soon as possible. <laughs> right. It's it's also the you know the the funny thing is at the beginning of the game you're choosing first first what you want to keep. Later yeah. you're choosing first to burn. You're like get, get, get rid of that. You know. Yes. Get it out. <laughs> It's really it's a it's a really neat game. The dynamic is really interesting, yes. and I think it's one that will definitely benefit from multiple plays. It's really really neat. I agree. And that's Cahoots by Mayday Games, right? Not right. there's yeah. another and Cahoots game that Jay came Treat, out. Yes, from, it's from yeah, Game Right. Game Right. Designed by Jay <laughs> Treat, I think. Yeah, um, really good game. That's also fun. <laughs> and it's just fun to say Cahoots. <laughs> yeah. Cahoots. <laughs> that's cahoots. a good word. <laughs> I mean cahoots. So you also played another game, the uh, Show and Tile, or you, oh, yeah. you also played. Yeah, do you want to talk about Show and Tile? I really like Show and Tile from Show and Tile. We we had, we had I talked about uh, Pantone last time last show, and we had played Show and Tile at Gen Con, and it was there's a level of kind of like a leap that you have to make in the design, and we had a friend Rachel playing with us. And she was just a fantastic designer. Like she was able to use the because t- they're triangles and parallelograms. Yeah, they're, that, they're ten you know, grams. The, yeah, and so you're laying them. You're tr- you get a, a, a three cards in your hand, and you choose one card that you're going to try to pick. One of the three words. There's oh, two regulars and one challenging, and then you dump the other two, or maybe it's two cards. I can't remember. I think it's three. And um, then you're assembling these tiles in a minute's time to make an image of whatever you're trying to communicate on that card and it's you know it's things and it's not anything famous but it's like one of the cards was like sunrise and you just use your tiles to make that work and um uh, rachel was really good at like layering and doing really interesting stuff we didn't necessarily get them um uh, one of them was really obvious, but the other two that were fantastic. Right. Were so like, you spend a you spend like a minute and a half or a minute to draw to draw with the tangrams, right? And then right. you take a minute to guess everybody else's yes. drawing. It's very and quick. it's a hidden guessing, right? So you write it down. Yeah, yeah. You write that down, then you you review. Everybody reviews what you guess. Yeah, it's secret. It was designed by uh, Isaac Shalev and Matt Loomis, and it's from Jellybean Games. It's really really cool. I made the leap in the designs. To, um, not everything was perfect, but I had, I don't want to spoil it because it is a game night, but I did a couple of things where I was layering things and everybody's like, that was what made me clear, uh, realize what it was. Like you realize, oh, hey, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to put everything together in side to side and use as much space. And I, and I realized that didn't, that wasn't what you needed to do all the time. Sometimes it's what the only thing you can do, but uh, it's very, very well done. And it's, they both Pantone and that have something amazing to offer and they're not very hard and they play very quickly. I mean, doing the things that you see, you're like, Ooh, this is hard to figure out. Most of it, like I said on Pantone, it's like, good luck guessing what this is, you know, because it's <laughs> definitely who knows, but it's really, really great. Right. Those are two episodes that haven't been coming that haven't come out yet. So no, look we forward to those. Yeah. We've been filming a lot of episodes. We mentioned Rachel who unfortunately is the one that's moving away, but Rachel came on, we met her at BGG spring we met her before that, but then we really hung out at BGG. Yeah, Frame I found then, out she and then realized in she LA. lived in LA. Yeah, and then she moved away. <laughs> and now she's moving. Oh. Away. She's great too. She's really fun. So it was a, it was a bummer. We were happy. So we had one game night that's coming soonish that had three three ladies and two guys. It was a miracle. It was that's amazing. To, I know to hear the game night start was totally bizarre to me because it's mostly three guys and one girl. And I was like, wow, this sounds different. It's really cool. So we'll figure it out. We'll find some more people. We're always on the look. look One out. day I hope to be there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We need to get you out there. Yeah. And Chaz, too. Chaz is West Coast. He could probably make it. I know. Uh, seriously. Yeah, that would be cool. I'm, I'm like an hour and a half flight away. Oh, yeah. That's nothing. 
So we have any news this week? Well, Eric Martin is on, um, what do we call it, uh, on assignment. Okay. <laughs> with his son. So we will, uh, we don't have a huge amount of news, but Lincoln, I think you had the list of the DSP, which is the Deutscher Spielerpreis. I don't know if that's how you say it, but that's probably the this year. The, yeah. the it's usually the gamers' game. Not to say that the winner isn't a gamers' game, but it, it swings more gamer heavy. So, yes, the yeah. usual winners. So this year, Azul won again. Surprise! I mean, I think Azul's Azul has won every major prize. Um, yeah, and, and it's a great game. It deserves to win. But the shock is, is it's not a true gamers' game because the Gaia Project was number two. Gaia Project. Raja the Ganges, mm-hmm. Clans of Caledonia, and Heaven and Ale were, was the top five. And then the kids' game was Memoir. But it was kind of a shock to not have one of the heavy games win. Um, but it's an undeniably great game. So uh, yeah. it is a different year for sure. Do you think that that speaks to the strength of Azul? Or do you think that the panel just had a different approach this well, year? Well, there is no panel. It's a publicly voted uh, prize. Yeah, so You can oh, just publicly okay. vote for it, yeah. It's it's it's, a, it's of the people award, which I did not know okay. originally. I only recently found that out that it was uh, voted on by people. Oh, you're not um, actually oh, part so. of that uh, DSP panel. <laughs> no, I'm on the S or uh, yeah, S2J. No, I'm on the International Gamer Award, which I just filed my uh, vote for this year. Um, I won't tell you what it is, but look for that the announcement of that winning uh, games, whatever the top two or top three. I forget what I think they have a top three. But the award actually just goes to one, the winner. So, um, should I say what my number one game of pick the pick was? When is it going to be announced? I, well, this is my vote. I will, you know I don't know what the actual winner. This should be coming out like soon. Like I had a, de- a hard deadline of like last week to give my vote in. So, I assume the winner if, is probably known. If if your pick doesn't win, will it leave you blue? So unlike I, I didn't pick Azul. Oh. I'll just say that. Azul was like okay. my number two, I think, or number three. Well, I he... really like Raj. So my number one, I'll just say it. Why not? It's something to talk about. I picked Raja of the Ganges as my number one. Ooh. Sweet. Which I got. To, I think a lot of people play haven't played. Sweet. Yeah, it's really great. It's another dice worker placement game. Hmm, I've been wondering why I like that. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I thought it was great. And and Heaven and Ale was up there, too. It was in my top three. Heaven and Ale, Raja of the Ganges, and... Uh, sorry, Raja of the Ganges, Heaven and Ale, and Azul. So the other five, I think, were like the Mine, Quacksalber, Clank. I think the Mine should win them all. <laughs> and then Pandemic se- Season Two uh, and Altiplano were the other top uh, five, uh, the other five in the top ten. But it was an interesting uh, year for sure. Um, I mean, I'm with you on the Mine. I told Sophie, the uh, owner of uh, Plan B, I'm like, this is the game to beat when I at Azul at Nuremberg, and I still believe that it's the a great game but i started betting on a different horse when i learned the mind which i i think azul's a winner it's a gateway game it's like a ticket to ride it's the once Agreed. a decade game that comes out yeah it's it's awesome yeah. absolutely i just the, the innovation of the mind for me was massive right it was undeniably huge for me but again i knew it was a dark horse because it doesn't work with people sometimes. It just doesn't work. And Azul can work for everybody. It's a great game. That's fair. So we're a little light on news, but I do have a Kickstarter to check out. It is Stygian. Is that how you say Stygian? I think Society. so. Stygian or whatever. S-T- yeah. S-T-Y-G-I-A-N. Yeah. Uh, that is a game designed by Kevin Wilson. And Ape Games is kickstarting it. And it's a dungeon crawl game with a cube tower, which I thought <laughs> was very cool. Yeah. And it's got like a little graveyard at the bottom of the cube tower. So when you drop the cubes in, if they land in the graveyard, they count double. So it's kind of a little bit of a dexterity. I guess it's un- an uncontrollable dexterity randomizer. So I thought that was pretty cool. And my good friend Kevin Wilson is the designer. So I figured I'd give him a shout out. Check that out on Kickstarter now. Cool. Stygian Society. <laughs> Stygian Society. Okay. Yeah, the Stygian Society is sitting at uh, $72,000 raised with 876 backers. So give that a look. If you like dungeon crawls like me, I'm obsessed with them. I'm looking forward to seeing how this one plays. It's got a lot of cards, too. So it's, I don't actually know if there's a board, if I recall. I think it's a cube tower and cards. Maybe there's a board. But it's a dungeon crawl in that world. Neat. So one more thing before we wrap it up. Uh, Chaz, you, you're into your second episode of the show Who's playing what now? Which I think you were questioning whether that title was going to work. And I think it does. Yeah, so... I like that title. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's... 
Uh, it's it's going really well. Uh, you know, um, the first episode that I did with Gary Pope, I, I actually said in it, kind of was treating it as a pilot and kind of took what we learned there, what worked and didn't work. And with the second episode that came out on the 20th, uh, Tiffany uh, Kyrez from The One Tar joins me and kind of tweaked uh, the round, split it into two different rounds, each with a different structure. And I think that kind of helps to keep things interesting as the game progresses and also uh, allowed the contestant to have kind of a catch-up mechanic. So that that worked really well. And Tiffany was great. Um, She had some really interesting um, choices of games she thought were being played, uh, which surprised me. But in the end, she she hit it out of the park pretty well there and earned a really good gift certificate for a viewer. And, um, you know, the, I'm already putting together the plans for the next episode. And so in a way, if you, the viewer, want to participate, there's two things you can do. You can go and you can comment on the previous video because we will pull someone's name randomly out of the comments who will be the person that we are playing for uh, to win a gift certificate. And also uh, record your plays on bgg.com, boardgamegeek.com because the more people who mark games that are played, it'll change our stats and uh, improve the data that we pull from. So uh, that's two ways you can get involved. Right. I really like the new format. It definitely has that more game show feel like putting the person on the spot, like the question, like your second half, the first half is free form, right? They can pick any game mm-hmm. out of the database that for just except for the top right. 10, except right? for the top We're 10, the top just 10. To put that little wrinkle in tw- it. Yeah, yeah. From there on, it's free, free uh, reign. But I really like where you pick the two games that have yeah. like similar titles or similar theme, and then you have <laughs> to figure out which one is played more. That's pretty great. Good, good. I'm glad that came out. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad that came across and worked uh, because I, I was surprised how uh, close some of those were. Some of them. There were a couple that were only like 20, 20 points away from each other. Right. I was definitely wrong on a couple of so, them. Like, she was it, right. I was, I was like, oh, she's totally wrong. <laughs> yeah, but no. I liked the reasoning that she used to rationalize her picks. And, and it turned, you know, she was right the way yeah. that she thought through it on some right. of them. It was great. Yeah. It's interesting how we, we were always playing like a lot of the hot new stuff, but that doesn't always get reflected so quickly in the BGG stats of, um, so like what we're playing now is definitely, diff- definitely different from the bgg community right so yeah and if you want to be participating go check out the video we'll link it can we make one of those little things appear in the corner you know where that little thing appears i'll see i mean who knows youtube keeps changing everything on us Ugh. yeah but if it'll at least be in the co- uh, comments below at, or For the sure. information <laughs> below all right that wraps up another episode of the board game geek show thank you again to my lovely co-hosts steph hodge Chaz baller and lincoln damers oh fun. i'm aldi by the way <laughs> <laughs> I think I forgot to introduce myself again. Anyway, thank you for all the comments and the likes. And, you know, we still have that uh, email. If you ever want to send us a question that we'll read on the air and you'll be famous and we'll uh, answer it, hopefully. Uh, And that email address is bggshow at boardgamegeek.com. Come on, write us, please. (laughs) Prove to us that you're listening. Yeah, please write us a question. Prove us you're watching. (laughs) Take care, guys. Bye. See ya. Goodbye, everybody.